Welcome to our virtual book signing. This is our virtual book signing tour where we don't have to go anywhere in order to read from these great fantastic books. Unfortunately, we can't sign it for you when you get a copy of the book, but if you get a copy of the book, perhaps someday we will be touring or we can find a way to sign it for you. The title of the book we'll be reading from today is called The Birth of Chaos, and it's by Dr. John W. Gilmore. You can go to the link below if you would like to purchase a copy of the book, and you could go right there. I'm going to read a little, little bit from the back cover to let you know what the book is about, then we'll just dive in and begin to read from it. It is a very funny book. It's a comical book, but also like most of the books that I write, it has questions in it about life, love, the meaning of gods and goddesses, and the human experience on earth, how we struggle to be free. This is the cover of the book. There was a crisis due to global warming. The results were hurricanes, flood, desperation, and famine. The only hope was a ship of extra extraterrestrials who were once worshipped as ancient gods on Earth. In this funny, light-hearted saga, Byron, our lead character, is taken on a ship as a child with his parents who volunteered to serve the gods to save themselves and their family. Later, Byron, the grown child of these servants of the gods, explores what it means to be a god and whether these aliens, no matter how powerful and intelligent, can possibly really be god. It is a fun, lighthearted story about the journey taken by Byron as the ship returns to Earth, bringing him back to his home world. To the chagrin of his fellow travelers, he is constantly comparing the belief in these gods to the one of his Christian upbringing and jousting back and forth with his mentor, Loki. You can get something right there when you discover that his mentor is Loki. So we're going to start at the beginning and read a few pages here. The beginning's always a good place to start. Starts with an entry. <laughs> to Earth Central Library and archives from Mage Central, Sydney, Australia. Please note the letter below. To whom it may concern, Earth Recovery Council, Melbourne. While looking through my trunk of old notes and ornaments, I found a journal more than 100,000 years old. From whence it came, I am not sure, I was never good at journaling. I was always too consistent, missing days, months, and even years sometimes. This person, this quote unquote God, must have been very good. It seems to be a very accurate record of the birth of one of the ancient and powerful gods who worked with us to rebuild the human society and awaken us to our full potential quite some time ago. Please place this in the archives along with the other materials I have discovered. This has turned out to be a great find. Signed, Clarence B., First Mage. This was the original letter that accompanied the journey when it was first rediscovered. Excuse me, accompanied the journal when it was first rediscovered. Attached to it is the original journal and the related story. Song of First Mage, Bailey Candor, another great discovery and addition to our archives. Bernard Rocklin, Ph.D., Historical Council, Sydney University. 
we open with Byron's private journal. The title, Byron's private journal, please do not read, dash, especially Loki. Journal entry number one. Running water always makes me sleep well. It always did anyway, before the flood that destroyed most of my world. Living on a small Pacific island was satisfying for me, even exotic. But then came the great shrinking, as it was called. Rising tides began to consume the land much more rapidly than anyone thought possible because of global warming. Our society called for the great leaders and their scientists. But they weren't there. They, in fact, had shared in the destruction of most of the planet because of a mixture of incompetence, arrogance, and greed. And there we were, the innocent generation, having to pay for it. We all thought we were lost until they came. <laughs> extraterrestrials believe it or not with the offer of salvation we never believed in such things but when my parents were offered the freedom to stay on earth and drown or to journey on a ship among the gods as slaves they chose life the gods minced no words they would be slaves or just stay on earth and drown the fact that I am here now means of course that they chose slavery to save all of us. That wasn't bad, I guess. Slavery to the gods. At least they knew that they would be slaves with their children would be free. Who would have ever thought that the gods they preached about and taught about in comparative mythology and religious classes were aliens. Aliens! I remember watching all of those silly documentaries on TV back then and later reading books suggesting that the ancient gods had been aliens. I was skeptical, but seeing the faces of these beautiful creatures with old mythical names attached to them soon became a daily occurrence. Those beautiful, awesome, yet cruel beings left me breathless for some reason. Here I am now not formally called a slave but close i'm somewhere between being a slave and a free human living among the gods it is a somewhat odd lifestyle freedom here does not mean protection or justice and fairness how can a human being who lives at the whim of gods be free without attaching himself or herself to the house of one of these gods and becoming the closest thing possible to a slave. That is what I have done. Even as part of this house, I feel alone and desperate. I don't feel comfortable living with beings that could squash me in a moment of, of anger or because of sadistic reasons of their own. I don't think they would mind you, but I wonder sometimes if we could have at least found a bit of land where we could have survived, or even if the waters may have abated by now, could we enter into a place where we would have been free? Could we ever return home as free beings? Or would I have to live like a temp worker the rest of my life? The ones who turned down the alien's gracious offer must have found something. I am sure that human beings like the viruses and parasites they are, would find a way to survive. There is not time for such considerations now, though. I must attend to one of my gods. We worshipped one god on earth. My parents did anyway. I was always unsure of such foolishness. I wonder how this one god fares against all of the aliens who consider themselves gods. I can see them, touch them, feel them, but that one is nowhere to be seen. Not yet, anyway. Talk about being full of themselves. These god beings wanted to be worshipped before because of their superiority. Now they feel justified in demanding it, considering 
they were the ones who saved all of the terrestrials, as they call us, when they are being polite. Had we just stayed and had you continued to worship us, you would still have your earth, Hathor says repeatedly. I dare not correct her. I am not of her house. We left you for just a few thousand years and your ignorance has destroyed everything. How do you respond to such a statement? I did by becoming a priest for one of these beings. I am one of the few who still know how to write. Better than that, I not only write in English, but in the letters of the gods. I am the keeper of records, which allows me to keep the journal in which I now write. As I bend, knee, pray, and worship, meditating on their images, I actually feel safe and secure. Or are they gods? How can an alien be a god? A face looking over my shoulder appears out of nowhere. I am used to this by now. I glance at him and continue to write. His hair is dark and long. His peaceful face hides an untamed wildness. His jaw is strong as if chiseled from marble. His eyes are black like onyx, boring deeply into your soul until he smiles. Something about him is peaceful and soothing, but I think he is a bit too self-assured, I write. A bit too self-assured, he echoes back while reading along. What a pompous dung beetle you are. Perhaps your goddess will protect you for a while. He moves across the room gracefully, finding a high back chair, roving out of basket straw. He sits, leans back, and looks at me. One day Diana's little pet may be left to me. I assure you, I will teach you to respect whom you serve then. I want to push the issue, but I dare not. He may be right. He may even be reading my mind at this very moment. Some of them can do that, as if they are really gods. As if they are really gods, he says, leaning slightly forward. Oh, you little unbelieving heretic, you. You must learn to respect your superiors, whether they be gods, aliens, or a toaster oven. Forgive me, great father. Sometimes my thoughts are not as I desire. Your thoughts are always not what I desire. And what is this great father? He leaned forward. It doesn't sound authentic coming from you. I have many names, but I don't expect you to call me great father. Not you. What would you like to call me? He leans back. I grin a little, but dare not speak. He smiles with me. You are a devilish one, aren't you? I warn you. Stay clear of Zeus, or one day you might regret the day you were born. Even more, Loki? What happened to the great father? Is that gone so fast? He just looks at me askance, waiting. I feel a bit like a small rabbit sitting in the cage with a boa constrictor. Diana better watch over you, or you might just get swallowed up. This god thing has even become tiring to me we constrain ourselves and force ourselves to act out silly myths created by cavemen and fools who could barely speak and then we wonder why we ourselves are so unhappy shakes his head slightly i told them not to come back to this little planet i told them to let all of you drown and be done with you but they didn't listen they thought they saw something special about your kind. That is a joke. I know you have something to say, young man. Speak it. I am a priest, Loki. Is a priest not a man? What will you silly humans come up with next? Don't bite your tongue. Speak. With a little effort, I can read your mind, you know. It is such a tangle of competing thoughts and ideas and so much ugliness that I hate to do it. I hesitate to do that. Don't be so insulting. Don't you have anything good to say about humans, I asked. They make good omelets. You mean you eat people? No, you salami head. They cook good omelets. 
I can't understand why you're still here. I was brought here with my parents, who are dead, he interrupted. Jesus, don't you have any feelings, Loki? I have feelings. I'm a loving God, sometimes. Just like you are loving, sometimes. Does it still hurt? Does what hurt? That your parents are dead, of course. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Good, he said, fingering a small juncture in the woven straws. You are getting over it. I only wish my father were dead sometimes. He doesn't even exist on the physical plane, but his overbearing spirit still lingers like rotting flesh. I don't understand how you talk like that, he looked at me. Begin to, he smirked and narrowed his eyes a bit. I think that you will find that you are late for kissing your goddess's backside. We don't want her to get angry now, do we? I'm late, I said, realizing what time it was. I began to grab all my things and rush out, my feet thumping hard against the stone floor. I rushed back in and saw him walking toward my journal, which I quickly received. I quickly turned, rushed out to worship the goddess. What will I have to put up with with her? That is the introduction and the conversation with Loki. Journal entry two, and then we'll skip farther in. The ship was quiet now, dimly lit, moving through space. If not for the windows, one would think he was in a large building and a labyrinth of dark hallways with high ceilings and sharp right angles on solid ground. The hallways are very wide with dark marble floors covered with gray lines running through at various angles and the walls and ceilings are blacker like onyx and smooth as glass. Dim yellow light seems to emanate from somewhere that I can't find. It just seems to always be there when you need it. At several of the junctures where three or four hallways meet, there are small gathering spaces where people talk. The guardians of the ship stand there, and every so often, a god speaks to the people and answers any questions they might have. It's like a book signing without a book. <laughs> the followers of various houses meet and mingle to get to know each other in those spaces. Most of the priests and priestesses are the descendants of the earth in this part of the ship. I have heard that it is galactic, full of various humanoid creatures from throughout the galaxies, but only those who have been saved from some impending doom and decided to become the servants, servants of the gods. Being a priest is a good calling, one worse, with the gods themselves, to fulfill all of the religious and psychological rites for the people who decided to remain here on the ship and fulfill all of the necessary functions like cooking, cleaning, educating the children. The common everyday things. I guess you can consider them workers in heaven. LOL meaning <laughs> The gods are at the center of everything and the priests are their representatives. The priests are somewhat like the psychologists for the people and the healers and counselors of the gods, depending on one's function. One actually has to take care of the psychological well-being of the gods, or they sometimes become somewhat violent. Being the powerful creatures that they are, bad temperament can be a danger to other gods, and especially to the human beings. The priest reminds the gods when his or her absolute power is about to corrupt absolutely in a friendly and caring way. 
we meet with these gods face to face as priests or priestesses, some of us doing rudimentary tasks while some move into the inner circle and some the inner inner circle, a place that is close to intimacy with these beings. It is a prospect both frightening and desirable to many of the priests and the priestesses. I have mixed feelings about all of these things. I was a Christian, my parents were anyway, and I learned repeatedly about the one God and that one could not bow down to idols. I was told that all of these previous gods were demons. I question that now, but in the back of my mind, the question still remains, are they really gods just because they are superior to us in certain ways? Is the one that the Christians worship really God because it is superior to us? What does it mean? to be a god. I guess I'm just a questioning priest. Some are not, of course. They just go along with the program, fall down before these gods and lick the floor clean. So the gods put their foot down on a clean floor. I rush past a beautiful creature named Marva she is the darkest, most beautiful human I've ever seen. She often looks through me as if I am not there as the stars in her eyes burn for Osiris. Osiris, by any other name, for he has many, is Osiris. I give her a slight nod. She nods back and continues to rush in the opposite direction. She likes to lick the floor. I enter the hallway leading to the house of Diana, also known as Artemis, and by several other names. She is sitting there in a comfortable lounge with servants standing around holding bowls of fruit and vases of water, pouring the warm water into a large basin and placing it in front of her. The room is a veritable cavern full of tables, chairs, statues, fountains, pillars reaching upwards, but not quite reaching to a ceiling that is more than 10 meters high. She places her feet into the basin of warm water and looks up as I enter. Her face is blank, no frown, no smile, just a straight line as a mouth, no irritation, no impatience there, just Diana. Her eyes are ridiculously beautiful, green like fine jade. Her dark hair is long, down around her shoulders and back. The servants are weaving it into the usual long braid that she wears hanging down her back most of the time in public. But in her chambers, the inner circle, she wears it loosely most of the time. Not when I am there. She is extremely beautiful, but very young looking with old eyes and an air of serenity. It's a bit scary. The attraction that I feel for her is just overwhelming. I look, pause, and wait as she looks at me. She is waiting for something. She is wearing a simple white cotton tunic Revealing strong, muscular legs that are long and thin, her arms and shoulders are strong. I just stand there wondering if she is reading my mind at the moment. I guess not. She would probably slap me silly if she were with what I was thinking. I approach her in my normal groveling, priestly way, carrying my many tablets and books. I wonder if she would have me read her a story, read a poem, or sing chants and praises to her. My goddess, I am sorry. I am late. I had another one of your conversations with Loki, 
the master of disaster. I laughed under my breath. Yes, goddess, how did you know? Never mind that. Put your things down and put a stool over here in front of me. Get that small table over there, too. She motions to the table, sitting just to the left of the entryway. I want you to work on my stiff feet. I set my books on the edge of one of the many Greek-styled tables in the room. The whole house is designed in early Greek architecture. I guess I've gotten so used to it that I don't even usually notice it. The large Corinthian pillars that end holding nothing up. A few statues of Greek heroes and mythological creatures. The tapestries of the Parthenon and other Greek things, as I call them. I don't understand, I say, pulling up a small stool and sitting right in front of her. She smiles a little bit for the first time since I came in. You don't understand which word Byron, work, or on, or my, or feet. Which word don't you understand? <laughs> my feet are tired, and I want you to rub my feet. Is that too much to ask you? You are my priest, aren't you? I think you should priest then. Don't you? That means touching your feet. I felt very stupid after I let that slip out of my mouth. She let it hang there. You are a goddess. You don't need your feet rubbed. <laughs> Do I have to force you to take care of me or should I call someone else? I thought I could trust you, as skeptical as you are, to care for my needs. Am I wrong? Would you rather clean toilets or something? Of course not, my goddess. There is no comparison. But touching your feet, I mean, they are at the bottom of your legs, in essence. I would be touching your legs if I touched your feet. Her jaw dropped slightly before she recovered. She leaned back and brought a hand to her forehead. I'm sorry, I was just joking, I said, knowing full well I wasn't. Put that little table right there in front of me, she said. I put it there. Get the towel sitting next to that basin, she said. I got the towel. Are you a robot or something? Do I have to tell you to do everything step by step? You are wearing my patience thin. You know what to do. I've seen you do it before with some of your little human friends. Do it with me now. I began to protest but didn't. I got the towel and put it on the table. How did she see anything? She put her left foot up. I dried it and wrapped half of the towel around it. She then followed suit with her right foot. I dried it. They were nice feet, but very big. She had some pedestals on her, even though I dare not even think it too loudly. She wouldn't be pushed over so easily. There was a scented lotion near the basin. I picked it up and rubbed it onto the left foot and began to give her a light massage to soften the foot and then go deeper into any points that held tension. She closed her eyes and leaned back a bit. You've been doing this for a while, haven't you? For people, yes. Why do you do it, she asked. I guess I'm just a healer. I like to help people relax and live better lives. I feel like that is my calling. Your calling is to be my priest. Isn't that enough for you? It is, but I feel like being a healer is part of being a priest. She looked at me quizzically. I guess you could say that. You must do this regular with me. It is a new sensation for me, having my feet touched like this. No one has ever done this for me before. That is surprising. And why is that? You are a goddess. You would think that the priests would want to take care of you, or lovers or others. Lovers or others? What do you know about my lovers or others, or lovers of the gods? You shouldn't be speaking of such things with me. Why not? Are you getting a little turned on talking about it? I don't believe this. What are you asking me? I'm just curious. You are overwhelmingly beautiful. You have to know that. How can someone not know that? And you must have plenty of lovers, or at least those who would like to be. Men and women, I would guess. 
I've heard a lot about the myths and about the Greek and Roman gods taking mortal lovers. Have you? Maybe I'm raising your expectations a bit too far by letting you touch my feet. That isn't what you are raised. I'm sorry, goddess, I am out of bounds. I should say so. Now continue to work on my feet in silence. It's not what you're doing that is annoying. It is your continual chatter. If I need you to work on anything else, I will let you know. Your mind is an ashtray full of perverted fantasies about the things you want to do with me, and you don't even know it. They are in your subconscious. I'm sure they are, goddess. Sometimes, she added through narrowed lids. She leaned back and closed her eyes. Wake me up when you're done. So that is an introduction to the life of Byron as he journeys on these ships, working with the many, many crazy people he runs into. He keeps working and working until he graduates to a level where he becomes part of the inner circle. We're going to jump a little bit ahead. In this part, Byron begins to learn a little bit more about Loki and his friends in the inner circle and the inner inner circle. This is 11, journal entry 11. Loki and I got along better than I expected. I met with him late at night for several months as my relationship also deepened with Diana. I realized why he had been chosen for my mentor. It was only later that I learned officially, not from Clyde, that I would be taking his place on Earth when we arrived. I would be the trickster and the magician of the gods as we started, a new pantheon on a world that was once again struggling to survive. The world had been at war for more than 500 years. The first were conventional, and then someone got the bright idea of using a nuclear warhead on a planet where there was scarcely enough land for growing food. Some fool decided to lob a nuclear warhead. This fool was soon joined in by many other fools, of course. Before they knew it, most of the soil was useless. The only survivors were people who adapted the nuclear radiation. Everyone else died off quickly. On top of this, the ruined atmosphere along with the sunspots and increased EMF activity soon killed all of the computer-based technology. The next 500 years, people began to rebuild. It was as if everything started over completely. We were going to a very rural superstitious planet like the one that the gods had come to during Earth's early development. And guess what? This was not the first time. This cycle seems to have occurred on Earth several times. Each time, some of the descendants from the previous world were taken away until things turned around and then they returned. I was shocked to discover that we had been away for almost 2,000 years. It was going to take a pantheon of gods to help develop Earth again because of their level of psychic development. So here we were, different gods to take on different names and different peoples and different nations. This would be hard work. Loki seemed to have liked it so much that he never wanted to give it up. Now he was. He said that he had found his perfect replacement. He would be moving into the God the Father role for the first time after many, many millennia. This is very strange, this work of the gods. I still find myself 
somewhat disillusioned. We were sure that there was only one God and that we were well informed. We thought that we knew that one God when we lived on earth. Everything else was superstition. It took all of this flood escape and serving the gods to discover that there were more than one and we were the ones who had been superstitious back then. Diana was enjoying herself. Our relationship had really grown. She was the love of my life and I the love of hers. I constantly wanted to be with her and she was the same. We were really living in paradise. She loved to hear stories about my lessons with Loki. She would try to help me with some of my tasks only to give up, shaking her head and laughing sometimes in a nice sort of way, of course. If they are anything, the gods are nice. Diana has a wild spirit, but she is also very playful and kind. When she is serious, she reeks of intelligence and skill. I love her and she loves me. I think we will be together for a while. Soon I have to prepare for my mentoring lesson. Loki's trying to get me to move a ball from point A to point B with just my mind. I made it hover a bit for about a second, which really made him laugh as he hurled it across the room with just the thought. He's been at it for centuries. Why shouldn't he be able to do it? When I brought it home to Diana and asked her for advice, she took the wall and winged it across the room and said, I've moved it. What's so hard? With your mind, I protested. Oh, well, that's more difficult for you, she said. Oh, thank you, goddess. Jesus. What do I have to put up with every day? In any event, she does give a pretty good massage. Yes, believe it or not, I have had the goddess give me a massage and do even more. LOL. And so they continue on their journey. Returning back to the planet of their origin. What happens when they get back? Ta-da! The opening of the second part. And then we will end the title of this, The Song of First Mage, Bailey Candor by Barry Reeves. Deserts, lakes, and forests. As far as he could see, small fires dotted the earth, temporarily beating back, but not quite overcoming the shadow caused by the cloud-covered night sky and too many bad decisions made by the caretakers. The earth had been a beautiful, fertile planet with oceans, deserts, lakes, and forests. That's what the mages said anyway. Since they had discovered that so-called journal a few decades before, they had been even more fanatical. It was said to have been stolen from the gods by the god Loki and delivered to the first mage. Tristan doubted that very much. The mages were always talking, trying to teach humanity to better itself. But why mess with perfection? Tristan thought. Not really more of a lost cause. He put another log on the fire. There was a thud followed by sparks. Bailey glowered at him for a moment but continued her teaching. She, after all, had been trained to teach the people the magic of internal wisdom and discipline. Even these backwards people. She brushed a wayward lock of brown hair from her eyes and continued noting just a hint of smile on Tristan's face. Why did he bother her so much with his subtle teasing? She wondered if he had romantic interest. 
Who could be interested in a mage woman in an ugly, baggy dress who hadn't bathed for a week? Yet again, he was one of those nationalists back to earthers. During the time of separation before the Great War, black people, as they called themselves, willingly separated themselves from the dominant culture, which was known as white at the time. During that time, people were constantly hurting each other because of the color of their skin, the shape of their noses and lips, and the features of their hair. Everyone did this, but the white race, who had most of the power and resources, were best at it. That ended with the great shrinking, when most of the resources of the world were lost, as the water began to rise and the land shrank. People became nomads and everyone was on an equal playing field. The black nationalists saw this as an opportunity to free themselves from their oppressors, only to find that the oppressor was still there. When the big oppressor was gone, they could see that the small oppressors had always been there from their own group that had been obscured by the big ones. And worse, an internalized mindset that made everyone desire to be an oppressor. Upon this discovery, they became very interested to do extensive work over generations to dismantle the mindset and learn to live in harmony with the earth. Later, they became integrated, dropped the word black, and remained just nationalists. But that was the ancient history. A hand went up. Mistress, a shy feminine voice said, Can you tell us about the gods again? The gods hear us. They are testing us now because of our unbelief and the sins of our ancestors. But there is blessing even in their testing. Because it is forcing our minds to grow and expand so one day we will be like the gods themselves. When we have grown enough, they will return and they will share the secrets of the universe with us. She lifted her face towards the cloud-filled sky. Can't you just feel them right now? Nods answered back. When will this be? A tall, dark man asked. She recognized him. He was Martin, one of her most advanced students. No one knows for sure. All I can say is soon. Them... And Jesus, Tristan said before he could bite his tongue. He quickly lowered his eyes as several small snickers erupted around him. Who would be interested in a maid woman, Bailey asked herself. A nationalist skeptic, she thought. If Jesus comes, he will be accepted too, she answered smoothly. When she saw him smile, she knew he could be hers with little effort. She had him nibbling on the hook, but would she take him? Would she play this out to the end? A mage's husband would be a difficult life. The traveling, the hard work, the following of her calling, could he possibly live up to that? She, did she want that for anyone? And then she smiled and then she knew that she was actually his. So, the aliens come, but not as aliens, as gods. This is a journey being taken by Loki, formerly Byron, to try to recover the great leader of the gods so that peace would be found and earth could thrive. The journey had been long and hard so far. He found that he was different than before. He wasn't tired. 
the heat of the desert did not affect him, nor was he thirsty. In fact, he didn't even really need food. He ate and drank very little to make Bailey and Barry comfortable, but he really didn't need it. It was the hottest part of the day. Bailey and Barry had set up a tent that only consisted of four poles and a large canvas top. Loki liked the fact that Bailey and Barry took care of themselves. They would travel, but not during the midday. They often took naps when the sun reached its peak. They made the trip a bit longer, but helped them maintain their health, as well as give them time to have discussions. They wouldn't let Loki help with the tent or searching for food or water. He did, however, help them without their knowledge. Yet again, they had to know that something was happening when their wineskin remained full of water for almost three days. Amazing, isn't it? Bailey asked. We haven't had to search for water for three days. This skin doesn't seem to empty itself. It must be bigger than you think, Bailey, he said. Oh, sure, she responded, a skeptical look on her face. How are you doing it? Barry looked alarmed and tried to shut her. It's all right, Barry, Loki said. He looked at Bailey. What makes you think I'm doing anything? No one can do that. No false god, anyway. I never said you weren't a god, he just looked at her. Well, I did at first, she admitted, but not now. How are you doing it? You wouldn't understand. What I'd like to try, Barry said. Loki sighed. Lord, Barry added. Loki looked at him and pursed his lips. Barry grinned, and he did also. I changed the law of the nature in the skin so that the elements of the universe inside are constantly creating what turns out to be water on a subatomic level. What? Barry exclaimed. Can anyone do that? Of course. Many beings can do that. They call themselves gods. They have attained such a level of power and awareness, they have to consider themselves gods in order to remain responsible and accountable for their actions. Who are they accountable to? Barry asked. Each other their followers, and the father of the gods. Unfortunately, you have locked him up, so there's no telling what these powerful beings will do if they find out. So we are in danger, Bailey asked. As long as he is in the box, we could have a war among the gods. When that happens, the humans will be drawn in. That would be devastating. Well, we had better get him out. We better get you home soon. Barry said. She nodded. Don't worry too much, Loki said. Things usually tend to work out as they should. But how many lives will be lost? Barry asked. No lives, just body. Bodies. A spirit is never created or destroyed. It just moved from one place to another, recreating the soul each time until it is mature and free to return to its own source. The body dies, but the spirit and soul doesn't. How do you know that? Bailey asked. Loki looked at her. I am a god. I know everything. Jesus. Jesus. Why do you say that? Do you know Jesus? Barry asked. It's an expression, Loki said. But I dare say that I do know him intimately even though he is rejecting the crucifixion thing now and his humility, I wouldn't look to him to be a sacrifice again if I were you, I'll tell you that. I can't believe this, Barry said. You mean the ancient gods really exist? Yes and no. It's a bit more complicated than that. Explain to us, Barry said. We have the time. This is a long journey. I don't want to talk about the gods. I want to talk about you. I want to talk about humans and why you, he turns his attention to Bailey, are so skeptical. She brought her hand to her chest. Yes, you. Barry grinned. You're not far behind, Loki said. Barry just smiled. Loki turned to Bailey. Well, why the skepticism, he asked. Why not? We've been through a lot. Where were the gods then? 
the gods came to earth and offered to save anyone who would serve them by taking them away from the destruction. Several large ships came. Those who wanted to be saved left. The others who did not trust the gods stayed here. The gods came through the human family because of their arrogance and pride. Refused to go because they didn't want to be servants. Well, how could you expect people to just go along with aliens? Barry asked. Some did. Many did, and their descendants ended up traveling through the heavens with the beautiful ancient beings as old as time itself. I guess it all ends up depending on one's faith and what one has their faith in. One needs to take risks sometimes to gain anything. You need to put your faith in me. Barry arched his brow. You see me, you touch me, you hear me. How can you not believe in someone who is standing right in front of you? It's like the Jesus thing. His disciples would have been fools to not believe in him while he was standing right there. I believe in you, Barry said. How can I not? How can I not? Barry said. Good. Then we are one accord. Let's get ready to travel. The clear sky suddenly became overcast. There was a gentle breeze from the west. What a coincidence, Loki said, as they prepared to move out. That is the end of this. Our readings, and remember it is from our book. The Birth of Chaos by Dr. John W. Gilmore. It's hard to see one here. Available Amazon.com. You can hit the link below and purchase it there. Namaste, everyone. Have a good evening, good morning, good afternoon, whatever time period you're in listening to this, and stay safe.